That, I needed that, thank you. Good morning. If you've been coming here for years, welcome back. And if you're new with us today, well, welcome to FAC. My name is Jack Froy. I'm a student here at Faith Alliance Church. And we've only got one announcement, but it's a big one. VBS is starting July 15th through July 19th at 9 a.m. to 11.30. It's for kindergarten through fifth grade. Sorry, guys. <laughs> and, um, you know, I got this uh, yesterday. I was looking at it. And Pastor John and Pastor Nate were so excited that they wanted to come up and do like an a cappella of the first song, but it would be too hard to mic up, you know, Pastor Nate, so we just didn't do it. <laughs> um, so it's for kindergarten, you know, through fifth grade. We've got games, worship, and food will be provided. I might have to show up. Uh, and we're looking for a, a couple more volunteers, and we also are looking for a lot of donations, specifically empty tin cans, toilet paper, and paper towel rolls and boxes of all sizes. Uh, please contact Mrs. Debstein if you're interested. Now, in my hand, I have two cards. The blue card is our thanks for joining us today card. It's our connection card. And this card allows us to get in touch with you. And if you are, you know, if you're new or if you've come in here for a little bit and want to talk to us about, you know, what it's like to be a member here at FAC, you can fill one of these out. And our green card here is our taking our next step card. What this card has allowed us to do is you can tell us what, you're what you want to be involved in or interested in. And after you fill this out, you can give it to the Welcome Central, which is my right, your left. All right, so, the song now? No. <laughs> All right, if you please stand and take a moment to greet one another. This morning's scripture reading is short, but it's serious. Today we're going to be doing Acts 1 through 4, Acts 8, 1 through 4. And Saul approved of his execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. Devout men, devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentations over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. May God add his blessing to the word and may we welcome Pastor John back to the speaking platform. Normally, uh, when I get up here, I, I introduce myself, uh, just in case people don't know who I am, but this morning I'm actually going to introduce myself because I've been gone so long. My name is John, I'm the lead pastor here at Faith Alliance Church. Uh, I have been gone four weeks out of the last six, uh, so if you don't recognize me, that's why, because um, I'm new. Uh, but I want to say, before we get into the message, before we get into some little housekeeping uh, regarding the message... Um, I want to say thank you again. A couple weeks ago, I was here on Father's Day, and I want to thank you for, uh, again, uh, your support and your prayers and your cards. Um, you know, we've been to exotic places like Florida, uh, and we've been to exotic places like Wisconsin. Um, and uh, it's, it's been very meaningful in the passing of my father. My father passed away a few weeks ago. Uh, that, that you guys who knew him just a little bit uh, really, uh, really surrounded us as a family. Uh, my mom uh, in Wisconsin, my sister and her family. So we're grateful uh, that, uh, to, to A, be back in Massachusetts, but be have you as a church family. There's a great verse about, about the family of God, the body of Christ, mourning with those who mourn and, cel and celebrating with those who celebrate. So I just want to say thank you uh, for mourning with us uh, in this season. Um, but I am grateful, uh, thrilled even to be back, to be preaching, just to, just to get back to some sense of, of normalcy. Um, so we're back in our, our series called Source. And we're looking through the books of, book of Acts. We're trailing this early fledgling church that was sent by Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to go and make disciples of all nations. And so we're watching this church kind of make its way, find its way through the world and find out how, what to do and how to do and how to follow the Spirit and what to say, what not to say. And there's trial and error and there's difficulty, as we'll see this morning, there's a lot of uh, things to celebrate, a lot of things to rejoice, and a lot of difficulties. Um, and so what we can 
be comforted in is that not a ton has changed. We're still, by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, following Jesus in the world, working to make disciples. And there's still things to celebrate. And there's still difficulties. And there's still uh, uh, failures. And there's still victory. And there's all this stuff wrapped up together. But the one thing that, that's constant, that has not changed, is that Christ has sent us through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to make disciples. So we still get to do the same stuff that they did way back when, and we still have the same struggles. We just don't have to wear the sandals, which is great news. A little bit of housekeeping about this message. I was, uh, if you notice in your bulletin, if you're observant, you'll see in the, the sermon notes page, it says Acts 8, 1 to 25. That's what I was going to preach on, and I was uh, finishing up the message yesterday, and I got about halfway through and kind of working through the, the content, um, and I realized that I actually had two messages, and I had a choice to make. I could either preach for an hour and a half today. Oh, okay, choice made. Or, just kidding, or, 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 we cut it in half, and I just preached the first four verses this morning and the next 25 or 20, actually, uh, uh, 26 next week. Um, so that's what we're doing this morning. We're just taking one through four. So I, I texted uh, uh, John, uh, who leads our worship, and John, who uh, uh, read the scripture from John, and I said, hey, hey, John and John, it's John. <laughs> if that wasn't confusing enough, I'm like, guys, we're cutting off about 20 verses. We're just going to do Acts 1 through 4. Acts 8, 1 through 4. So, so it says Acts 8, 1 through 25 on your bulletins. We're only doing the first four verses this morning. Uh, the bulletins were already printed by the time that decision was made. So, um, but the reason I want to do that, the reason I really want to slow uh, this passage down is because the, the, the event that happens in Acts 8, 1 through 4 uh, is entirely significant to not only the book of Acts, but to the history of the church. And, and I felt that in my preparation, I was just kind of blasting through the first four verses. And I really wanted to slow down and talk about what's going on, not only in the book of Acts, but then what, what the implications are. What does that mean for us as a church as we read about what happens uh, to them uh, a couple thousand years ago? So we see this historic event in the life of the church in the opening verses of chapter 8. John read it, but I want to read the first portion again, at least the first three verses. Again, you can tell that I kind of curtailed some things. It says Acts 8, 1, 3, 20. So I was like, yesterday, I'm just busting to get this stuff all, all set. It's mostly set. And Saul approved of his execution. So let's stop there and talk about what happened uh, in that execution. Who got executed? So way back... In Acts 6, if you were here, and I was not, so if you were not either, that's okay. Um, I, and I do want to uh, pause on my uh, uh, pausing to say this. Um, I am entirely grateful for our preaching team at Faith Alliance Church. Um, in the last, yeah, you can give them a round of applause. For uh, Tim and for Tom. Tim Berkwin, Tom Jenkins, and for our uh, Pastor Nate uh, to really not only step in to maintain, but step in to really push forward and advance what God is doing here at Faith Alliance Church through the preaching of the scriptures has been incredible. Um, I did not worry uh, one bit while I was gone whether or not Sundays would go well or uh, things would happen or not happen because we have such a good leadership team. John Varney, I, don't, I never worry if I'm not here because John Varney is such a strong leader and a, and a, a, a strong worship leader that I don't ever worry if, if things are going to go well or not. I just know that they're going to go well. Um, so I'm, I just want to stop again and, and say thank you uh, to the leadership team of the church who really upheld and advanced things while I was gone. Um, so now, if you're following me, now we're going to go back to Acts 6. There's uh, a bunch of deacons who are commissioned by the apostles to, and the deacons were there to serve uh, the, the needs of the people. There's this guy, Stephen, who was uh, uh, one of the deacons, and he was not only there to serve the people, but he was also going to preach. And so Stephen in Acts 7 preaches, and he preaches this incredible message about the history of the church, or the history of the, the Jewish nation, about who Jesus was and what happened. And he preached so uh, to the point, to the quick. He cut to the quick so well that they killed him. 
The, the, the uh, Jewish ruling group at the time did not like what he was saying about Jesus and about their uh, faith system, the Jewish faith system. And so they executed him. And overseeing that execution is this guy named Saul. We're going to meet Saul a little bit more in detail in a couple chapters. So in a few more weeks, we're going to see Saul um, have another incredible thing happen to him in the history of the church. But we'll kind of put a, a pin on that for now and say that Saul at this point is leading this charge to, as the scriptures say, ravage the church. So this guy Stephen is killed. And the next chapter, chapter 8, we see Saul approving of his execution. So that's, what, that's kind of the, the moment that this uh, event uh, takes place from. So, and there arose on that day, Stephen is killed, there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. These verses are incredibly important to our understanding of the book of Acts and to our understanding of the church. Because what happens is up until this point, the church is pretty much settled in Jerusalem, one city. Right? And in this city, they're, they're, they're uh, developing believers. They're making disciples. There's signs and wonders. People are being healed. There's a little bit of persecution with some of the apostles. They're getting beaten. They said, don't preach the name of Jesus. But it's all happening within the city. It's pretty well contained. Then Stephen is executed. And Saul begins to ravage the church. And what happens in that moment is the church scatters. The church leaves and goes to Judea and Samaria. Now what's interesting about this phrasing, Judea and Samaria, is that Jesus, way back in Acts 1, makes this promise. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be by disciples. You'll be witnesses in Jerusalem, where they were, in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so this persecution, something that the apostles, the early fledgling church, the vulnerable early fledgling church would not have chosen for themselves, scatters them into the very places that Jesus had promised that they'd go and be witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And so what started in Jerusalem now gets pushed out into the ends of the earth. And the rest of the book of Acts rests on these four verses. Because what we see are all these people going all over the place. Next week, we're going we're gonna to meet a guy named Philip who's in Samaria. He comes along, this guy named Simon, we'll get into next week. But, but there's, this, there's this incredible uh, of, event that sends all these people all over the region into the ends of the earth to be witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, persecution had an effect. These four verses, the ravaging of the church, had an effect. It changed them. Now, this is something, like I said, that the church wouldn't have chosen for themselves. Nobody in Jerusalem would have raised their hand and said, yes, please, to persecution. Yes, I would, I would love to go to prison for my faith. And because they wouldn't have chosen for themselves, it was because it was something that they wouldn't have wanted necessarily. We kind of look at that, and I don't know about you, but I kind of read these first four verses and I go, yikes. This is not a pleasant history in the early church. This is not a pleasant point of history in the early church. But yet, it's exactly what propels the church into the promise of Christ to be witnesses in the world. So, so well, it's not what they would have wanted, not what they would have chosen. It was exactly what was used to make them into who God was calling them to be. So this persecution had an effect. Well, it's, it's incredibly terrible. It became, an it became an opportunity for the church to spread the message of Jesus. See, what happens oftentimes in any organization or in any church throughout history is that 
when we're not pressed, when we're not pushed, when we're not challenged, we get comfortable. It happens subtly and it's a little bit sneaky. But every organization, every church drifts one direction on their own. In. And the church was never called to drift in. The church was called to be a family. It was called to be a body. It was called to love and support, to mourn with those who mourn, celebrate with those who celebrate, all that stuff. But it was never called to drift in. It was called to go out. On its own, on, on our own, as a church, we will drift inward. And that is a big issue. It's the fate of every church everywhere to drift in instead of drifting out. And it's the way of organization and churches. And so this, this persecution in Acts 8 forces the church out. It, it keeps the mission of the church at the forefront. It keeps the passion to see uh, people become Christians white hot. Not something they would have chose or wanted, but it kept things white hot. It kept the mission of the church white hot. It moved them out. And so, well persecution or difficult things aren't things that we would want for ourselves. Sometimes those things squeeze us into a place where we recognize what really matters. And it, it challenges us not to drift inward, but to move out, to be the witnesses of Christ in the world. But that tension, that feeling of setback, doesn't feel good. It never feels good. Whether it's persecution or whether it's inconvenience, those kind of setbacks never feel good. But what they do, what they often reveal are the things that really matter. So when we go through things that we don't want to go through, what often happens is all the, the trappings in life kind of drift away and you get real clear on what really matters. So when this persecution happens, they're not thinking, I need to grab my cell phone. I need to make sure I get my home entertainment system. I need to make sure I get... They're just going. And all that other stuff falls away and they recognize, okay, this is what really matters. And it's a strange thing to talk about persecution as being a way to really define what really matters. And we'll get into why that is in just a few minutes. But because these setbacks never feel good, we often think they're a waste throw them away, trash them, we don't want them, we don't need them. I just want to feel good. And so we think about setbacks as being useless. That tension being useless. When I was growing up, um, I, believe it or not, I had a pinball machine in my room. Uh, if you knew my dad, you'd know why. It just made sense in our family. For whatever reason, it was a small pinball machine, but I had a, a pinball machine in my room, and uh, my friends would come over and we'd play pinball. It was the 80s, so that's what we did. And I don't know if you've ever played pinball, or if you're uh, Gen Z, if you even know what pinball is. Uh, I'll try and explain it. Um, but it's basically a big box, and there's a metal uh, uh, ball that, that you hit, and you try and keep it out, keep it from getting into um, this, uh, this kind of trap at the end, and it hits a whole bunch of bumpers along the way, and you get points. Um, so I would play this game, and if you've played pinball, you know what I'm talking about, but you'd hit the start button, and it would shoot this metal ball into this little alley. And you'd take this thing called the plunger, I looked it up, called the plunger, and you'd pull it back. And there are springs on the plunger, and as you pulled the plunger back, it would create tension. And you held it back as far as it could go because you wanted that ball to shoot through the alley around and start hitting the bumper so you could gain points. And you pulled all the way back till it stopped, you'd feel the tension, you'd let it go, and it'd spring forward, hit the metal ball, and shoot through the alley. And it's right at the point when you can't add any more tension to that plunger that you knew you were exactly where you needed to be to start that game. And tension, or even, even a literal setback, you're pulling it back, that tension, that setback, was the only thing you could do to start 
a game of pinball. And oftentimes in our lives, it's the tension that allows us to be launched into new places in our lives. It's the setbacks that we think, man, I've gone three steps or four steps or five steps. It's those setbacks that allow us the opportunity to launch into new places in our lives. New, very specifically, God-given places in our lives. And so that tension is good. It just never feels good. So what we consider setbacks, persecution. Christ would look at it as a set up for something new. Where we pull back the the plunger and we think, man, I've just taken five steps back. We often fail to think that this is exactly what's needed to push that ball through the alley into the game. Some of you are facing setbacks right now in this moment that you think have disqualified you from life or whatever you want to define in that room. And I want to say to you that maybe that setback is actually Christ set up for you. That maybe you're in a place that you would not have chosen for yourself. But maybe you're in a place where tension has been made that Christ wants to use to pull back on your life to launch you into something new. I don't know what that is and I won't define that for you because I'm not, I'm not you. But what I do know is that Christ uses things that we would never have chosen for ourselves to push us into places, to squeeze us into places, to show us what really matters in places that we never would have thought of before. So tension never feels good, but it is good because Christ uses it. So I I felt like it would be fitting for a few minutes as we talk about the persecution in the first century to talk about persecution in 2019. I want to talk about persecution around the world because I don't know if you knew this, but Christians are being persecuted all over the world right now simply because of their faith. In fact, the last three years have been the worst years for Christian persecution in the history of the world, at least as long as we've been tracking it. We've been tracking it for a while. And there's a lot of data concerning persecution, and I'm not going to show you everything. I do want to show you a quick map And this matters because we're part of a network of churches that is not just national, it's worldwide. And so we have people, friends and family, who live all along these places that are very difficult to be a Christian in. We we know people who are moving. You know people who are moving to some of these regions. And it's not just about the people we know, it's about the people that we share a common faith with who are finding it in this day, in 2019, very difficult to be a Christian. So the darker colors, as you see, are the the more dangerous places uh, that are there to, to, to be a Christian. So if it's a dark orange, it's harder to be, or like that red is harder than the dark orange, harder than the yellow, right? And this is a new map as of 2019. As of 2019, so this year, over 4,000 Christians have been killed simply for their faith worldwide. That's a 30% increase from the previous year. So right now, there are 30% more Christians worldwide who are being persecuted for their faith than last year. And they would define persecution very specific in which people are not just um, uh, given annoyances for being Christians, but they're either imprisoned Uh, uh, discriminated against directly or killed. And so in the last year, not even year, over 4,000 people have been killed. I'm sorry, I I think I said 30% or 40%, 14%. So worldwide, what that translates to, about 215 million people were persecuted against last year. There's been a 14% rise, which means now about 245 million people have been persecuted in the last year. That's, that's the right numbers. And, and this matters, and it matters for a number of reasons. It matters for Acts 8 because we see that things don't always change. What was persecuted in Acts 8 in the early church is still happening in 2019. It matters because at, at this moment where we are uh, allowed to Uh, uh, gather freely because of the freedoms of our nation. There are millions, millions of people worldwide who are gathering in secret to celebrate and worship Jesus.
And you might be thinking, if you're here this morning and you're not a Christ follower and you've been listening to me for the last 20 minutes or so, and you think, wow, <laughs> really glad I kind of dodged a bullet there. Sometimes literally. But, but I want to I talk to you for a minute about why people continue to be Christians in places that it's very difficult to be Christians. Not only do con- people continue to be Christians, but two things continue to happen. People still go to those places. People are moving to those places. Also, the church, not in every country, but the church in some countries are flourishing. The church in China is flourishing. There's been a huge crackdown the last six months on, on uh, underground churches. But the church continues to flourish. The church in Iran, which is very difficult, one of the top, most difficult countries to be a Christian in, is growing. And that's kind of mind-boggling. So if, if it's illegal and may cause you imprisonment, might even cause you death to be a Christian, why is the church growing? People today want to know what works. They want to know what's real. They want to know what matters. There's nothing more real than someone who has found something so good that they're willing to give their lives for it. We're called to live for Christ, but there's people today all over the world who are thinking on, on, the, on the front of their minds, today I could die for Christ. And they're still choosing to follow him. Because Christ is that much bigger and that much better than anything anybody can do to them. And so why is the church growing? Why are people still going to these difficult places? Because Christ is bigger and Christ is better. And when people find Christ, people in these regions are having dreams about Jesus, not even knowing who he is. Because Christ is calling people to himself. And he's bigger and he's better than anything anybody can do to them. And because of that, the church grows. And we have the same Jesus that they do. We just don't experience the same persecution that they do. Now for sure, our culture has changed and it will continue to change. We are by every definition, though, not persecuted. It's not a fair comparison to make against countries that are persecuted. We might be discriminated, Christians may be uh, uh, gone to the margins, but we're not being persecuted. So we're going to talk for just a moment, not only about the church in the world, but then the church in America, and what do we do? See, what's happened in the last 40 years in the church in America is, is not that we've become persecuted, but that we had been a central voice, a central place of influence, a central place of trust. And so not only theoretically, but even geographically, churches were built in the middle of town. This church started, guess where? In the middle of Attleboro. And all over the nation, churches were in the middle of town, and people would use churches as community centers, and they would go, and they would find the church to be a a central location, and faith was more or less assumed in a lot of ways. Christianity was more or less assumed in a lot of ways. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But over the last 40 years or so, that has really shifted to now the church has kind of moved to the margins of society. The church is no longer the central voice. The Christian church is no longer the central voice. The Christian church has kind of been pushed, culturally pushed to the margins. We're not trusted as much or at all. We don't have the same influence. When When we speak from a place of faith, the response is not always but oftentimes one of skepticism. And you have to kind of cut through a lot of that skepticism or doubt or what have you in order to have a reasonable conversation about faith. And that's not even a complaint. That's just kind of where we're at as a culture. Not a New England culture, not an Attleboro culture, but but a, a national culture. That's where we're at. The church has been removed from the center. Now we're kind of at the margins. We've lost our voice of influence. And that's frustrating because we've experienced that change that's really hard. And things probably won't get a ton easier. I don't, I don't think that the church will find itself in the center of culture again. So even you might, I definitely do, feel the tension of that. Feel the pullback 
of that, feel the lack of opportunity, feel, feel something missing from that. Oh, it used to be this way, and now it's not, and it's this way, and I don't like it. We didn't choose it. We don't want it. No, we didn't. Absolutely not. And it feels like there's some tension there. And I wonder, I just wonder, if this is an incredible opportunity to be witnesses of the gospel in our culture, in this day and age, in America. So we just have to ask the question, how, God, how are you calling us to be witnesses? How are you calling us to be bold? How are you calling us to be the family of God? How are you calling us to live? In obedience to the Father, empowered by the Spirit, for the sake of people who do not yet know. Because Jesus is bigger and better, not only for people who are being imprisoned and killed, but for people who are indifferent to the gospel. He's still bigger and better than all the stuff people are chasing right now. And we have an opportunity, not a setback, but a setup, to be witnesses, to be a people who proclaim and call out the goodness of God in the land of the living. So what if our setbacks our setups. What if our ends, the, the end of being in the center of influence, the end of a relationship, the end of, of uh, whatever it might be, what if our ends aren't setbacks, but actually setups? We have a hard time with, with ends. Like sometimes we, we feel like ends are just like these setbacks. Something ends and we're like, ah, now what? We have a difficult time talking about things that end. When we see things end, we think, what's wrong? What if nothing's wrong? What if an end is exactly what an end is, a setup for what God is doing next? As we live and grow and develop and mature, situations that we are in as we grow in Christ don't fit anymore. It's kind of like trying to put on a jacket that you wore 10 years ago. I don't know about you, but a jacket that I wore 10 years ago would not fit. And sometimes we continue to try and wear those jackets and hold on to those and and continue to stay in situations that just don't fit our maturity anymore, just don't fit how we're growing as believers. And so an end is to take those things off and say, okay, I'm not going to need that anymore. I've grown in Christ. I've changed. And so an end is not a setback, but it's really a setup for something new. The greatest end in the scriptures, we sang about it before, is the cross of Jesus. We see the heart of God in the cross of Jesus. It seems like, in the flesh, the most defining, devastating end that could ever happen. Not only is Jesus killed, he's killed on a cross, the worst way to die. And we kind of sit with, now we know the end of the story, but we kind of sit with this end and like, oh, what do you do with that? Why did it have to happen that way? The, the disciples, we know they went back to their normal lives. They're like, well, I guess that's it. That was good for a while, but we're done. But what they didn't realize is that end was an incredibly well-designed setup for this new life that we are still living in 2,000 plus odd years later. It's through that end that we get to the renewal of all things. It's through that end that Christ was resurrected from the dead. It's through that end that Christ offers us the forgiveness of sins. It's through that end that we're offered new life completely and entirely in him. It's through his end and his death that we find our own death, but then through that end that we find his life and in that our life. Let me share with you a scripture in Romans 6. This is Paul, who used to be Saul, right? He's ravaging the church in Acts. Now he's writing the New Testament, so we'll get into all of that in a little bit. It's crazy, but it's incredible. But this is Paul writing to this church in Rome. And he says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized, and he means to be placed into Christ, all of us who have been placed into Christ Jesus were placed into his death. We were ended. We were buried, therefore, by him, with him, by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. 
For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. And Paul's referring to a spiritual death and resurrection. That in Christ's end, we were ended. But that in Christ's renewal and life, we were given new life. And so every end, every bit of tension, every setback has, has gospel opportunity all around it. The question is, how are we going to choose to see it? What are we going to do about that? How do we live with that individually, and how do we live with that as a culture? I love being a part of the church in 2019, because I cannot wait to see how God uses us in the margins. I'm excited to be a part of what God is doing, not only in New England, but around the world, in America, in Attleboro. So the scriptures tell us that through ends we see renewal and beginnings. So you may be experiencing something that you would rather never experience. That might feel like an end. It might feel like tension. It might feel like something you would never in a million years choose for yourself or your worst enemy. But what if? What if? What? What if? This setback is really a setup for what God wants to do in your life. What if your worst setback is Christ set up for you? So as we address our setbacks, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying this, by all means, I'm not saying that we should just minimize these setbacks and be like, well, it's, it's okay. Because really it's about a setup. Our setbacks are real. And they're difficult, and they're heart-wrenching, and we need to respond to them appropriately. We need to see them for what they are. Whatever they might be, they're difficult. The great thing about the Christian faith, and actually John Varney, who leads our music, balanced this wonderfully this morning. About regardless of what's happening in our life, we still get to worship who God is. That, that, that God takes the sufferings, and he takes the victories, and that in either of those, he is not changed. So whether you're in a set back or a set up, if you're in a set back, don't, don't, don't dismiss it. Don't be quick to kind of push your way through. Allow God to lead you through it. But what I can say about setbacks, what I can say about struggles, what I can say about sufferings, what I can say about the persecution of the church in Acts 8 is that it was definitively a setup for what God wanted to do in the world. And so if God can take this guy who's ravaging the church, imprisoning people for their faith, and see the church flourish, I just wonder what he can do in your situation. Now, now my question, the, the kind of the so what, the question in this is, is what do you do in the middle of your setbacks? How much access right now does Jesus have in the middle of your setbacks? That's been something I've been really, I've been really questioning and struggling with personally as I've been experiencing a setback. Is Christ, how much, how much room am I giving you just to work? How much access am I giving you? Because in the middle of a setback, we don't want to give anybody access. Put the blinders on. So in the middle of your setback, how much access, how much room are you allowing Christ to move and to change and transform and to, to recreate in you a set up? So we can see our opportunities and our opportunity as the church, not as loss, but as renewal. So no matter what it is you're dealing with this morning, I can assure you in Christ as, as James likes to say, consider pure joy when you struggle. I read that over and over again, and, and about half the time I'm like, man, I don't get you at all. And the other half of the time I'm like, thank you. Yes, consider it pure joy when you struggle because it produces something. Our setbacks become setups as we allow the Lord Jesus access into our lives. When we have the worship team come up, I'm going to pray. 
if you join me, and then we'll respond uh, in singing. Jesus, we, we recognize that you are um, bigger and you're better than anything we could ask or imagine. Your glory exceeds our imagination. Your glory exceeds our, our realities for certain. And Lord, I'm sorry for, for any way that, that we've, we've tried to shortcut or, or, or try and, and shade your your glory. Father, would you take us and first show us, show us your heart seen through Christ. And would you clarify our setbacks so that we could see you in them. And then Lord, I do pray that you would, not without minimizing the setbacks, would you launch us into your reality? Would you launch us into what it is you're calling us to? Would you show us the, the set up uh, that you have for us? As you led the early church from persecution to flourishing, I pray that you would lead us as a church. Would you lead us as families, as individuals, to find and follow you in places of setup? For the sake of your name, for the glory of your name, for the advancement of the kingdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we reflect. <clears throat> Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. So, um, as we've done many times, uh, we send quite often from our church people to different places and uh, to serve and to be missionary. Uh, one in particular we send quite often because uh, she goes so often 
uh, is uh, Don Matera, who founded Love From Above Ministries, which we partner with and are a part of. Uh, and if you don't know who she is, uh, Dawn founded and started this ministry uh, quite a few years ago and uh, has gone to Romania to minister to the least of these, the orphans and the, and the gypsies. And, uh, and she helps a church that's being built out there called Canaan. And, uh, and just so many, I couldn't list it all right now, the, the, the things that she's done and the, young, the folks that she's helped. Um, and so she's going again at the end of this week. It will be the second time this year. And she'll be there for several months. And, uh, and we really just want to pray for her, pray over her. Our church has partnered over the years. She has her office here in, the, in our church. Uh, we are also the center for shipping all the clothes and donations that come in. Our youth have been getting sweatpants and socks for her. And so uh, we so appreciate the, the work that she does. Uh, that I'd uh, just like to have Dawn come up this morning. And, oh, I'm looking back there. With her son Todd and his wife Katie are here this morning visiting. I haven't seen you since youth group days. <laughs> it's good to have you back. So uh, we love you, Dawn, and we just want to pray over you. I'm going to invite the, the elders, the staff, anybody who, would, who uh, would like to come up and just maybe be part of praying over Dawn as she prepares to... Uh, to go to Romania once again and minister to the least of these. And um, thank you for what you do, and it's, it's a privilege for us to be a, a part of it. So I'm going to ask Pastor to sort of lead from here. As the uh, elders come up, we, we like to do this at the end of our services when we can, when people are leaving. Don leaves and comes back and leaves and comes back. Um, but sometimes people leave and we, we agree fully with the uh, idea of commissioning, talking about you know, turning our endings upside down into uh, launching. Uh, and we, we practice commissioning, and commissioning means to, to mission together, co-mission, mission together. So when we send people into the field, whether they're moving or going overseas, uh, we want to send them as a church uh, to mission together to the people, in this case to Romania, that, that Don is going to serve. And so as we pray together, um, you're a part of sending Dawn back into Romania for a season as she uh, serves the least, the last, and the lost um, uh, uh, in Romania. So if you join me uh, as, as we pray for Dawn and send her to Romania. Lord Jesus, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for the family of God that, that resides in Attleboro, uh, but also exists worldwide. Um, God, we are, are grateful for that, that level of reach, a uh, reach that only you can accomplish. Um, we recognize, God, your work in Dawn's life, and we thank you for how she's uh, consistently, over years and decades, served the people of Romania, um, uh, both here and when she's, when she's there on the ground. And God, we ask for you to completely cover her, um, not only to travel, but, but also, uh, God, would you uh, pour your mercy on her, pour your grace. May she be filled uh, head to foot with, with your love as she, as she goes, because I'm sure as she gets there and arrives, she continually pours out uh, to people who have uh, no means of giving back. And so I pray, God, it would be you uh, pouring out into those lives. May they see uh, the Lord Jesus Christ through Don's leadership and Don's ministry there. So God, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, we send her, we commission her, missioning together uh, to go to Romania to be the hands and the feet, the voice of Christ uh, to people who uh, are left without hope. So God, may she be a carrier and a bringer of hope in the name of Jesus. Amen. And as you go next week, we're going to be picking up the story uh, on Simon and this magician. He's going to try and buy the Holy Spirit. It's an amazing story, so come back next week. Uh, Stan and Janie Walker are going to be here next week. They're going to share with us about 